The expression, make it one more for the road, has taken its place in the English idiom as meaning that one last social drink before going back home. Highway safety organizations vehemently warn against the idea. But it does persist, and the problem of the social drinker has come to be of major proportions in the United States. Moreover, the tragedy of the habitual drinker is his increasing dependence on his drinking. Ranging every social level, eventually, alcoholism gnaws away at the minds and bodies of the men and women it afflicts. Joe Summers happens to run into a case of this kind of drinking today when he visits an old acquaintance, Frank Michelson, Chief of Police in Lakewood. The Chief can see you now, Mr. Summers. Please follow me. Well, thank you, Officer Vega. Joe, come on in. Have a seat. It's been a long time since I've seen you. Well, good to see you, Frank. It has been a while. I think last time it was Officer Michelson, and now it's Chief Michelson. Yes, well, I guess somebody has to get the ulcers. <laughs> but what can I do for you, Joe? Well, Harry Goodman asked me to bring by these sample layouts for the poster for this year's policeman's ball. Oh, that's right. It's that time of the year again. Well, I always leave that decision to Fred. <coughs> Vega, would you come in here for a moment, please? You don't mind waiting while Fred looks them over to you, Joe? Certainly not. Yes, sir? Uh, take these art layouts down to Fred's office and ask him which one he likes the best. Certainly. And, sir, a situation just came up. Patrolman Potter wanted me to refer to you. It's about, uh... Go ahead. Well, sir, there has been an accident on South Shore Boulevard, and the woman who caused it was intoxicated. So? It was Mrs. Aldridge again, sir. Should we press charges? Yes. It's gone too far. Tell the officer to proceed, but to keep me personally informed as to the developments. Yes, sir. I'll have these back in a moment, Mr. Summers. Fine. Would you believe it, Joe? I'm going to have to press charges against the Mrs. Eleanor Aldrich. Do you know who she is? Well, I believe she owns the estate at the top of the hill on Farragut Circle, doesn't she? Yes, that's the lady. You know, Joe, I just can't understand it. Why, when I was a rookie patrolman, I thought the typical alcoholic was the bum you had to kick out of the back store rooms. You know, the guy who just loved booze. But I found out over the years that there is no such thing as the typical alcoholic. You mean no uh, common background pattern? Exactly, Joe. They're rich, they're poor, they come from good homes, broken homes, respectable families, and those that aren't. Well, I think I agree. Take this Mrs. Aldridge as a case in point. Now, she has everything a woman could possibly want. Fine home, beautiful clothes, prominent family, many friends, and yet this is the third time in two months her drinking has come to my attention. Oh, that certainly is a sad thing. Well, the first time we found her drunk in her car, we had her hospitalized, and I went to see her to talk to her. I'll never forget the way it went. She was laying there wide awake in that hospital bed, just staring at the wall, and then I walked into her room. Mrs. Aldrich, Mrs. Aldrich, may I speak with you a moment? Oh, yes, it's our chief of police. I haven't seen you since the mayor's lawn party in June. I'm most sorry. Sorry that your men had to pick me up, Mr. Michelson? So am I. But I suppose that my treatment was standard procedure under the circumstances. Well, Mrs. Aldridge, you must understand. Oh, Dr. Hampton, how nice of you to come so soon. I came as soon as I got your message, my dear. We'll have you out of here in no time. Oh, Joseph, you know Chief Michelson of our police department. How do you do, Chief Michelson? You're looking well, Doctor. Thank you, Chief Michelson. If you don't mind, I'd like to be alone with my patient for a while. Well, not all, Doctor, but I would like to speak with you for a moment as soon as you are free. Well, certainly, in just a moment. I'll wait in the corridor. Sorry to keep you waiting. That's quite all right. I gather that you are well acquainted with Mrs. Aldridge. Yes, I've been her personal physician for the last eight years. And I suppose you want to know what effort is being made to help her overcome her drinking problem. Well, frankly, doctor, yes, I would. Confidentially, Chief Michelson, Mrs. Aldridge is an alcoholic. Really? You see, she followed a pattern that unfortunately is common today. I call it the cocktail circuit. You know, the drinking party with all the right people there, and you're constantly encouraged to freshen your drink. But not all the people on the cocktail circuit, as you call it, are alcoholics. Not yet, anyway. 
But if they continue as heavy social drinkers, they are certainly potential alcoholics. You mean anyone is a potential alcoholic? Well, some doctors would disagree with me there, but I personally believe that though the resistance may vary, sooner or later anyone can enter the danger zone. But why would someone like Mrs. Aldrich allow herself to get into that condition? Well, sometimes it's a case of not realizing how frequently they are escaping by means of the bottle until it's too late. Yes, but what I mean is, why would a woman like Mrs. Aldrich, who has everything, need an escape? Well, we all have weaknesses or fears, and we all need ways to escape them at times. Some, however, find their escape, their crutch as it is, in the bottle, and by the time they realize how dangerous the crutch is, it's too late. Then there is no cure for alcoholism? Well, again, we have much controversy, but I agree with those who say there's no cure in the usual sense of the word. So there are no cured alcoholics, just alcoholics who have stopped drinking? Well, we may have oversimplified, but that's the idea. And how do you help her to stop? In her case, I'm afraid it's going to be difficult. She must first admit that she is an alcoholic. And she needs something to believe in, some passionate conviction which will help her to fight the real cause, the weakness or fear that led her to the escape via bottle. In her case, I think she feels as if she has no real friends, just acquaintances who use her because of her wealth and social position. Well, that certainly could cause great anxiety, but it's going to take a great deal of self-control to conquer the habit itself at this point, isn't it? Self-control to fight the habit and love to fight the cause of the habit. That's the big order. Well, Doctor, it was a first offense in Mrs. Aldridge's case, and so charges will be dropped. But I don't know how often I can conscientiously allow something like this to happen before we I, have to... I understand, and I appreciate your interest, Chief Michelson. I wish all men in authority took such an interest in helping people. But please, feel free to call me at any time. Good day. Goodbye, Doctor. So you see, Joe, I learned quite a bit that day. Well, it sure sounds like it. And I remember that night I went home and had a little talk with my two boys about how a real man could say no to that second drink, even if he was considered a little antisocial. You know, Frank, it's good for you to talk to your boys like that. Not every father would be interested enough to do that. But you know, I was just thinking as you were relating your uh, conversation with Dr. Hampton of two Bible principles I think I'll review with my family tonight. You mean not to drink? Well, Frank, the Bible doesn't forbid taking in alcoholic beverages altogether. Uh, Jesus himself made wine for a wedding. Hey, that's right. I remember something about that. But one Bible principle I had in mind really is good in many ways, but very important when it comes to alcohol. Uh, we're encouraged to be moderate in habits. That is a good principle. Of course, the Bible isn't vague on the subject. Uh, Paul the Apostle wrote in his letter to the Ephesians, do not be getting drunk with wine. <laughs> No, there's nothing vague in that. But what was the second principle you had in mind? Well, you remember what Dr. Hampton said to you about needing a passionate conviction to break the habit and uh, love to cure the cause? Do I? I'll never forget it. Well, the Bible gives one faith in himself and uh, a passionate conviction or purpose in life that helps him face life without an escape crutch like the bottle. What does the Bible say, Joe? Well, for example... I think you and I feel that the Bible is inspired of God, don't we, Frank? Well, that's true, although I don't profess to take it as seriously as you do. Well, we really can learn what God requires of us. Well, doesn't God love everybody? Well, not altogether, Frank. Uh, well, say for the sake of illustration, uh, you arrested someone and then set him free because he was a first offender and uh, promised never to do it again. All right, let's just say I did that. And then he went off and did the same thing again and again and again. I see. Sooner or later, you have to reach the breaking point. Right. Uh, we shouldn't picture God as holding out his arms to just everybody, but you have to try to do something to merit his approval or make him want to love us. All right, I can see that. Well, if someone knows he has to do something to merit God's approval, well, that will give him reason for being moderate and uh, exercising self-control. And if someone really appreciates God's love for him, and how that love benefits him, well, then that gives him that passionate conviction that Dr. Hampton was talking about. Excuse me, Chief. Here's the art layout which Fred selected. Thanks, Vega. Let's see. Looks pretty good. Here you are, Joe. 
Well, thank you. Well, I'd better get over to the shop and get this job on its way. Joe, it has been a real pleasure to see you today, and I've really appreciated your points on the subject. Say, give my regards to your wife, too. I will, Frank, and it's been most enlightening talking to you. Officer Vega will show you out, Joe. Oh, and by the way, give my regards to Harry Goodman. Certainly. Well, before you put the next record on, David, there's something that happened today I'd like to tell you about. Uh, something we can think about together. Sure, Dad. Today I had to take some art layouts to the office of the Chief of Police, and uh, Chief Michelson, uh, you remember him, Frank. Oh, yes, he used to be Officer Michelson, didn't he? Yes, I had a most revealing conversation about a very serious problem. Oh, what was that? Stealing cars? We've had a lot of that lately. <laughs> no, we got into a discussion of social drinking and uh, how it can lead to becoming an alcoholic. Well, that certainly is becoming a problem in this area. Yes, and uh, since it's involving more and more young people, uh, I thought it would be good for us to review some Bible principles involved with the subject of drinking. Okay, Dad. Uh, well, now, Debbie... Uh, does the Bible forbid drinking an alcoholic beverage? No, it doesn't. Mom, didn't you say the Bible says that God gave man wine to make his heart rejoice? That's right, Debbie, it does. It's in the 104th Psalm. But what does the Bible say about drunkenness, Dave? Well, the Bible condemns drunkenness and cautions Christians to be moderate and sober-minded. Excellent. Now, that's one of the principles we must keep in mind on this subject, uh, being moderate. But the danger comes in at occasions which call for a great deal of what is called uh, social drinking. Well, everybody uses that term social drinking, but well, what is it really? Well, Debbie, it's part of the planned recreation at a social gathering. Oh, I see. For example, at an adult party where it's taken for granted that everyone will want a cocktail or some other alcoholic drink. Yes, Debbie, a person may start drinking quite frequently just uh, because it's expected of him at these parties, and then more and more on other occasions. Well, Dad, I don't know about Debbie, but I don't go to parties where liquor is served. Thanks for your vote of confidence, dear brother. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, seriously, Dad, you have warned us never to accept any alcoholic beverages. Yes, David, and uh, it's not that I don't trust both of you, but you're not of age. I appreciate your concern, Dad. But uh, someday, and it won't be long in your case, David, uh, you're going to have to decide whether or not you drink at all, or if you do, how much and how often. So many kids at school, they're already drinking. Well, I can see this is going to develop into a real family discussion. Suppose I go in the kitchen and fix us a drink. That is, <laughs> orange juice. <laughs> and then we can talk it over further around the kitchen table. Sounds right? great. I guess that's one form of social drinking that I can participate in, right, Dad? Yes, Debbie, you win that one. Let's head for the kitchen. Appropriate, indeed, is the Bible proverb which says, Wine is a ridiculer, intoxicating liquor is boisterous, and everyone going astray by it is not wise. The practice of moderation in all our habits is the biblical course of wisdom. The program, All Scripture is Beneficial, is produced by the Watchtower Society and presented by Jehovah's Witnesses.